All right. Hi, guys. Matt Lemke with Your Gamer Goggles, and we are at Gen Con 2018. We are at, well, I don't know. Is, it, is the company DeGenesis, or is that just the name uh, of the game? DeGenesis is the name of the game. DeGenesis is the name of the game. Uh, This is our, the whole line here is, is 2029 Studio 2. We're uh, Game Masters, local game store in Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Uh, yeah. Oh, uh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania Games, Game Masters is the only place you can get the Genesis Rebirth Edition in physical print in America, in North America. Um, there is an eBay store that we have available, but Gen Con and, and Phil's Game Store in Pittsburgh is the only place you can get physical copies without you know, an extra 60 bucks shipping from Germany. All right. That, that's all good there. We, we understand that now. And uh, I didn't. These guys have been here, what, three years now? Uh, this is, I think, our second year at Gen Con. 20, last year was the first year we were at Gen Con. We were also uh, at, we also had a booth at PAX Unplugged last November. That was the first time I was here repping uh, the merch, repping the, the game. Uh, and this is my second time uh, with at the second year of Gen Con. Okay. So, they were really busy last year. Or third year of Gen Con, excuse me. Yeah, They're, they were really, really busy enough that I saw their game. They've got beautiful art. It's very appealing, and, but I just couldn't talk to them. <laughs> so, here we are. Here I am. And he's, he's going to give us a synopsis. Sure. So, the uh, the beautiful art that uh, Matt here is talking about, which you might be able to see here, I'm sure I'm sure you can also edit it, edit in some, some of the beautiful art we have, is all of the art, all of the vignette style writing that is present in, in the core books is done by a single guy, Marco Djurjevic, with the help of his Six More, Six More Vodka publishing studio, or Six More Vodka design studio, excuse me. Uh, Marco Djurjevic, known for Marvel Comics, doing art for them. This is his, his passion project. This is uh, what he does, what he loves to do. This crazy world, this crazy post-apocalyptic grim dark tabletop role-playing game is his passion project. Uh, and that's what the Genesis Rebirth Edition is. It's post-apocalyptic. Uh, in 2073, you know, 60 years from now, uh, asteroids crash down on the Earth, triggering a extinction-level event uh, that sort of wipes out billions. Uh, it's awful. And the only real places left in the world where humans can survive is most of Europe and most of Africa. I say most of because, you know, it's a post-apocalyptic role-playing game. Scandinavia is buried under a sheet of ice. Britain has continentally drifted. Uh, you know, islands have sunk. Most of Africa is cut off from the, from the rest of the world, you know, all that sort of stuff. And the game picks up in 2595, so hundreds of years after the Eschaton, the, ast the reign of asteroids that destroyed 10,000 years of civilization. And the world's beginning to get back up on its feet. Humanity is recovering. Superpowers are forming. There's actually like a country in Europe now instead of just a wasteland. However, as the world is warming up and recovering from the Ice Age, uh, it turns out that's not a great thing because the asteroids in the, that bombarded the planet, causing the deaths of billions, contain alien spores inside them. And these alien spores, called the primer, uh, want to rewrite all the DNA they find, corrupting plants, corrupting animals, corrupting the land, and of course, corrupting people, turning people into psychic monsters called psychonauts, which are both more and less than human. Psychonauts are the big bad monsters that want to supplant humanity off the food chain, basically. They're, they're, you, don't play, you don't play as one. It's kind of like older editions of, of Star Wars RPG where it's like, no, no, you don't dabble in dark side. You go dark side, the GM takes your character sheet away. It's sort of a similar thing. Is if you get corrupted too much, there's a, there's a benefit to being corrupted some because the spores have beneficial effects. You drink some, or you inhale some of the spores sometimes, you're able to survive what would normally kill you through hibernation or through um, hypothermia. Some, sometimes you're able to, it's able to help you win a combat because your reflexes are quicker. But if you get too much spore corruption, you just you become something else, something other than human. What scientists in the world of the Genesis call Homo de Genesis, thus the name. And, <coughs> excuse me, that's pretty much the rundown of the world. Um, uh, there's five cultures, there's 13 cults. Each, instead of having a class, a player character chooses a cult that they're part of. Sometimes this is literally a religious group in the world, but uh, sometimes this is a faction with a religious bent, and they're all cult there's 13 cults. Um, some of them are more common in other places, but in any campaign, anyone can play anyone from anywhere. Um, 
One of the things I love about this game uh, is I'm a big fan of history. This game sort of uh, um, takes influence from that. It's its own world, but it takes his influence from that. Uh, Africa has become the premier world superpower in this world because Africa wasn't hit as badly as, as the rest of the world. Africa's doing pretty well for itself compared to uh, the different cultures in Europe. Um, and it's, it's actually, people are actually much uh, able to speak with each other much more frequently because the, psycho, the psychonauts in Africa actually provide like a baseline translation effect. Like how in, 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 in sci-fi uh, shows like Star Trek or Farscape, people can just understand each other. That, that's kind of what happens in Africa. And people are actually able to commune with each other and actually form bonds much more uh, effectively because they speak basically the same language in most of Africa in this world. And so Africa is doing very well for itself compared to Europe and, and the, the spores that are eating them up inside. So what about the rule set? What are the rules like? Okay. The, the rule set is a D6 system, very similar in essence, I compare it to Shadowrun. However, uh, yeah. However, the better you are at something, the more dice you roll. You roll In this game, you want four, fives, and sixes. Those are your successes. Unlike Shadowrun, you don't need to roll 83 and a half dice to, uh, to, to roll. This game has a cap. If it, at any time you would roll more than 13 dice, you just count the, the extra dice beyond 13 as an automatic success. Just keep on, just keep on going. It, it, there's a cap there. Um, it, it's based on every character has a certain number of attributes, six core attributes, the number of skills, and they're linked. You combine those two, and that's how many dice you roll. You roll, get four, fives, and sixes, see if you succeed or not. What's interesting is that the, uh, the sixes are especially good to roll. Sixes are called triggers. Uh, triggers are or something you accumulate. With a regular roll, if you get extra sixes in your roll, it helps count towards whether you succeed or not in your uh, in your attempt. With weapons and combat, rolling sixes activates special abilities. So, for example, uh, um, the most infamous cult of this game are a group of doctors called the Spitalians. Each of the Spitalians, well not each of them, but they commonly have a weapon that's basically a spear with a set of garden shears duct taped on the end. Playing as one of those characters with that weapon, if you roll enough sixes, you get to squeeze the handle and cut off limbs, sever arteries, that sort of thing. Automatic weapons, uh, you know, you roll enough sixes, you get to just shoot again. At a penalty, you just keep on shooting as long as you roll good enough on your dice rolls. And then there are also, you roll enough sixes, you activate special abilities, pushing yourself beyond the regular limits of people. That's basically the uh, the rule system, besides the fact that instead of uh, a game like Dungeons and Dragons, where you're part of a class, and you're part of a cult, and that means instead of num progressing numerically in levels and suddenly instantly acquiring new powers, in a Genesis, you, uh, uh, you, up you get XP every session, you upgrade your skills, running f upgrade your running, your, your shooting, your surviving, and then you go back to your cult and you're like, hey, I'm a lot better than I used to be when I left here as a, as a low-level member, and you rank up. And that rank up, ha they'll give you equipment, they'll give you money, they'll give you social benefits like authority or s access to secrets that lower-level lower level members of the cult don't have access to. Um, and why, yeah, there, <laughs> well, <laughs> for, you know, now that you mention it. Spouses, we'll say spouses. Spouses, yeah. Uh, there is a religious group uh, in the Genesis called the, uh, um, the Jehominans. The Jehominans are based on a very Old Testament biblical religion. And so they do have a very separate, they have a very uh, di dichotomized, you know, women have this role in society, men have this role in society, which the game doesn't necessarily, that's a good thing, but that's what those people believe. And in, in, in this post-apocalyptic post world, people have found community and meaning in that. It doesn't mean that the game necessarily, uh, 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 you know, Espouses that's a good thing. This world is not very good. There are plenty. There are, there are people who are good guys, but this isn't a good guy world. Those battalions I mentioned before, the doctors, they want their primary goal is to free free the world of the alien spores, which I think would be a good thing. But they're not good people. You know, you, they battalions show up to a village. Two children are, are are infected. Burn the whole village down. It's the easiest way, or at least to them it would be. At least to them. Okay. At least to them, yeah. Okay, so let's talk products now. What? Yeah. So the main book, if you, uh, here, if we, can I grab a main book? A main book? Yeah. 
So here, if you can hold that. So this is the main bulk. Yeah, it's heavy. So uh, I'm gonna say about 12 pounds. It's pretty heavy, yeah. So the, what's required? This is what's required to run the game. This is actually two books, two core books. Uh, most games have one. It's split into two. Uh, one's called Primal Punk. One's called Catharsis. Primal Punk is the vignette-style stories I mentioned earlier that Marko Djurjevic has done himself. Um, and they are very well written. It's very interesting as a DM. Like, I want to run this game. How do I figure out what the world is like? Just sit down and read for an hour. It's it's very enthralling. It gets you into the world of this game and tells you about the history and, and what, what has happened uh, since, from 2073 to 2595 when the game picks up. Uh, the other book is called Catharsis. Catharsis is a it's a rule book. It's got all the rule system. What you need to run a campaign in this world, take a, a full advantage of all the rules, uh, as well as uh, how to build characters, whatever you get, what you get, what every rank in each in each cult gives you, both in terms of social benefits, equipment, you know, access to certain things like secrets and allies and that sort of thing. And that's what the two the two main books have. Both are 360 pages. Really, really high quality paper. Makes them really heavy. Yeah. Um, we also have a DM screen. Uh, Beautiful art. Yep. Yeah, we have. Thank you. Uh, we have. Here, can you hand me this battalion one? Uh, inside they're the same, but on the outside there's two copy. There's two versions. Uh, one has the Spitalian. Yeah, thank you. One has the Spitalian, which are the doctors I mentioned that would they would burn down a whole ch the whole village just to kill some children because they are German fascists. Um, this is they're they're good good people, just not you know it's people with good intentions, but you know that's what the he pathway to hell is paved in, isn't it? They look like Prussian uh, bike riders. Yeah, Prussian bike riders, World War One uh, uh, German stereotype, yeah. typical. A few people uh, I've I've seen at Gen Con were like, "Well, did the world end in uh, you know the First World War?" And I was like, "No, they just wear the helmets." Oh, it's the stuff that boils to the top. <laughs> exactly, it's what survived the apocalypse. And then inside the GM screen is this map. This is a map of yeah, it's a very nice map. Um, a few people are, are always uh, confused. Uh, the red is water. It's just it, the the water on this map is red because of the uh, um, the presence of the spores, sort of coming out of the earth and sort of making its way into the water. So this is most of your most of Europe, most of Africa, like I said. This one is pollen. Pollen. Yep. Uh, this whole area, Eastern Europe, is kind of blocked off. Those spores that I mentioned that want to supplant humanity from the food chain, uh, they kind of just have a whole wall that's slowly encroaching on the rest of Europe. Um, Spain is one of my favorite places in this world. It's called Hyberspania. And Hyberspania, most of it's jungle because of uh, climate change over the course of time in the apocalypse. It's mostly jungle. And uh, Africa actually has a foothold in Spain a la Renaissance times. Uh, Al Andalus has been reformed. And this map is included in, in the uh, GM screen. GM screen, I would argue, is essential because it's not that the books are poorly designed. That's it's the opposite. It's just that the books are very heavy. As a GM, you want to you know look up a rule very quickly. Uh, you know, how do I do this? How do I do that? Uh, it's hard to do in a in a book that's six pounds. GM screen is very succinct, very useful. I have one. I've, I've been running this game the past for three three months with my game group. I play online on Roll Twenty. I I bought a DM screen to keep like in physical by my desk to have to look at re rules and references because it's essential. Um, we also have, so there's three other products we have. Oh, well, four other products. So there's In My Blood and Killing Game. These are adventure books. They pr they provide, oh, that's fine. They provide, um, uh, they zoom into an area, add content in terms of cultures and conflict and uh, um, a lot of color. <laughs> Exactly. Uh, In Thy Blood is a story uh, that sort of starts as a murder mystery, but then becomes a, a choice of, well, do we want to start or do we want to stop a holy war? Is that a spoiler? When Baptists die. Well, it's on the back. It's probably not a spoiler. I have different opinions on spoilers. I think if you say, if you, you know, if someone would never watch something, but you tell them something that just happens, that's cool. I don't think that's really a spoiler. Baptists die in that book. Not really a spoiler. Now, what, is that, what, is that, what does that tell you? Yeah. <laughs> one of the one of the main religious 
groups that is also a cult are the Anabaptists in this world, and Baptists die. Killing Game is a story that's it's a, the conflict is um, the uh, the Protectorate, which is one of the few countries that actually still exists in Europe. It's it's not that this country survived the apocalypse; is that now hundreds of years later there is a country and it's called the Protectorate versus Africa. Africa is the premier world superpower of of the Genesis of 2595, and you know it makes sense that a place doing well like Africa and the Protectorate would have conflict at some point. And then what was released today, uh, which is very brand new, in the same vein as both of these books, is Black Atlantic, which. Here. I think I grabbed that. Ooh. Black Atlantic, which uh, the main book references Britain and the British Isles because there is continental drift and people can just kind of walk from mainland Europe over to yeah, over to Britain. Right in Gibraltar is no longer got water there. <laughs> right, the the, the uh, English Channel. Uh, but most people don't know a whole lot about it. Even though you can walk there, people don't go there because it's dangerous and there's a warlord called the Vulture who rules over it. This whole book expands all of that, all of the religious groups and people who live there in in uh, in Britain as well as there's an adventure. If you just pick this book up, you can just run it right out of the book. There's also support in each of these three modules we have that you can just run them one, two, three, sequentially in a huge long campaign. Uh, and this is our occult cards. Uh, uh, if you take the, if you actually slide them out, um, the occult cards are very useful for character creation. As someone, if you fall in love with this game as a GM and you're like, hey guys, go to your game group and say, hey, I want to play this game, it, it's not necessarily hard to convince people, but it's it's much easier when you have a visual aid like the cult cards. The cult cards have uh, uh, art of the various different of the 13 cults, the player character classes almost, as well as uh, uh, flavor text of what those cults represent, uh, as well as their symbol. As well, their iconography is also important as well. She wants to kiss you. <laughs> is it an apocalyptic? Oh, it's paler. Um, have you ever uh, heard of the Fallout, the sci-fi universe? In Fallout, uh, people go underground and, and uh, um, they emerge years later, and they're perfectly fine. Palers are a cult in, in the Genesis that's the same idea. People went into vaults to escape the apocalypse. Didn't go well. Uh, the Palers are... This is the main... Uh, uh, like an American Indian. Yeah, that's a uh, Jahaman, and that's one of the religi the main religious groups. And Anub that's an Anubian. Anubians are the, the priest caste of Africa. The Anubians are... They're on the same side as the Spitalians and the Anabaptists, because they want to get rid of the spores, but they'd rather just control it and keep it to themselves than just eradicate it entirely. Yeah. Chroniclers are one of the coolest ones. Uh, chroniclers are, de are descended from streamers, you know, people who are super technophile uh, before the apocalypse happened, and they want to turn the internet back on, but there's no servers, so they're struggling to hoard technology and keep it to themselves. Kind of like the Brotherhood of Steel from Fallout, but it's, they, it is distinct. Thank you. <laughs> I'm hoping to play the Fallout game while I'm here this year. Should be fun. And then the Clanner. Clanner is a not a generic cult, but it's a it all encompassing and encompasses all of the various different small groups and small peoples that exist throughout Europe and Africa uh, as one sort of catch-all class. That's a scrapper, I think. Probably, I would say so. And then the uh, Neo Libyans, the merchant caste of Africa. Uh, Degenesis subscribes to the the great man theory of history, uh, and and with the call, the call, uh, cards, um, besides the fact they're useful uh, uh, visual aids, there's also rules on the back of them to incorporate them into your game. So they're not just a you know use this for five minutes to help people pick out what character class. It also does that, but there's also rules on the included in these to uh, you know, help uh, incorporate that product into the game. Very cool. So what else is there? What's going on in the future? What's going on in the future? Uh, well, it depends on death. besides death and murder. Well, there's a lot of death and murder in the future, unfortunately. Uh, the Genesis is a, a world that has both people running around with machine guns and grenades and jeeps and people who uh, uh, live in the wilderness and just trying to get by. They have stone axes and, and stuff like that. There's there's both of that available as, as a power level. Um, one of the uh, uh, developing... Uh, you know, I love this game because it has various different political axes and uh, 
um, developments that are going on. Um, I'm actually in the home game I'm running. I told you I was running the uh, this game at home. I'm running um, a campaign that takes place two years earlier than the start date, uh, 2593 instead of 95, because the book describes in a place called Borka. Borka is one of the name is uh, the name given to post-apocalyptic Germany. It's it's Germany, but it's just they call it Borka because it's hundreds of years later. Uh, in the book, they describe that in the year 2593, uh, there's this the rise of the clans, basically a, a group of of, of savage uh, um, people that were exterminated, sort of just showed up one day. They 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 weren't actually exterminated. They showed up and they start tearing the protectorate down, start tearing down one of the few countries off of off of its walls and its civilization, and they're led by a mysterious figure called Chernobog the Black God. And no one really knows who it is, but the clanners seem to think of him as a god. <laughs> they, they talk about him like he's a god. Um, and most people didn't really take that seriously. But then there's this place in Borka called the Praha Republic. And it was completely cut off. You couldn't get there. There were it was it was a mountain there were mountain passes that kept it off. There was walls, there was machine gun turrets and landmines. People only knew about it from stories. Stor there were only stories of what went on in that place. One day, Chernobog walked up to its gates and walked through it. And destroyed it utterly. The, the, the clanners, the savage peoples who followed him, sacked that place, all of its technology, all of the stuff it had, just on a whim. He wasn't even going there. That's just one stop on his destination that this black god is carving across the post-apocalyptic ruins of Germany. And I'm, I'm running a game about that right now. Okay. Uh, be, I think it'd be fascinating to, you know, oh, this place that we've we've heard of only in myth. It's kind of like a, you know, Atlantis analog almost. We've never heard of it. We've never been there. Some guy just walked through it. Some just, you know, sort of walked up to the gates, waved his hand, a flash of light, and uh, a hot spot of civilization was destroyed utterly. Okay. So, anything else? That's about it. I, I'd be happy to tell you about all the complex political uh, stuff that's present in the Genesis Rebirth Edition. I'm a, I'm a big fan of that as a, as a role player and a DM myself, but uh, you know, we'd be here for hours. There's enough material in there to make several campaigns, and that's not even including the extra adventure modules that we have here at Gen Con. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, guys. Hi, guys. Meet the Nibbles, who's going to go down... <laughs> She just did, decided not to go down my back, so we'll do this for her so she's comfy. Uh, thanks for watching my video, and I appreciate it. Uh, please, please hit the like button uh, and, and share it if you, you know, know somebody who might be interested. And of course, there's always Twitter and the Facebook thingy, and soon I have a newsletter coming. That'll be down there or in a link below, and my kitty cat loves that idea. Uh, so anyway, uh, there was one more thing. There was one more thing. Oh, yeah. Subscribe. Be a part of my community. Our community. Let's make it grow together. See you guys at a con somewhere. Or a local store. Or if I'm driving through the country, maybe a game club. I don't know. You're not going to go knock down my camera. Bye, guys.